Now, a House hearing on the future of devices such as TiVo and other video navigation technologies. Communications executives talk about the government's new push to expand broadband access. Rick Boucher of Virginia chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Technology and Communications. This is about an hour and 45 minutes. The subcommittee will come to order. Good morning to everyone. Today, the subcommittee considers the steps that will be necessary in order to enable television viewers to go to electronic stores and shop for set-top boxes, much the way that people shop for television sets today. The set-top boxes would be made by a variety of manufacturers who would compete with each other in offering various features, such as digital video recording or internet-based functionality. Competition would also be based on the price of the box. Some of the more capable devices could become the hubs for a home entertainment center, switching information of all kinds throughout the household. The boxes, whether simple or sophisticated, would all have a key capability that is not present today, and that is the ability to receive the input of television channels from any cable or satellite company, and then display those channels on television sets. If that capability is assured, set-top boxes will become competitively available, and a tremendous amount of innovation would then occur in the design, the manufacture, and the marketing of set-top boxes. TV viewers will be able to make a one-time purchase of a set-top box and then keep it in service, even if they switch their cable provider. We've long tried to achieve the goal of making what we call navigation devices competitively available. In fact, our effort dates from the Telecommunications Act of 1996, in which we directed the FCC to adopt rules to assure plug-and-play capability between competitively available set-top boxes and all cable systems. Now, almost 15 years later, that plug-and-play capability remains an elusive goal. This morning, we consider the next steps that should be taken to help us achieve it. In the National Broadband Plan, recently released by the FCC, the Commission appropriately highlighted the need for a direct-to-consumer market for navigation devices and the benefits that devices with both TV inputs and Internet access can bring to our overall effort to enhance broadband adoption. I was pleased that the FCC published a notice of inquiry as a first step in assuring that by the end of 2012, all cable and satellite TV providers include with their services a simple gateway device that converts the cable or satellite company's TV signal into a common output that then could be processed by whatever set-top box the viewer may own. In the shorter term, the Commission is proceeding with a notice of proposed rulemaking with the goal of addressing the shortcomings in the existing cable card program as an interim measure until gateway devices are widely deployed. The cable card is used by TiVo, which is the major provider of digital video recorders that today are available at retail for conditional access to cable programs. A workable cable card system could bring other providers into this market as well. To date, the cable card regime has been riddled with complications. First, the installation of cable cards typically involves several multiple hour visits by sometimes untrained technicians. Secondly, pricing of the cable card has been inconsistent and is often very expensive. Third, some cable operators have been moving programming to switched digital video platforms to make more efficient use of their bandwidth. But a cable card-enabled device cannot access switched digital video without substantial and, and somewhat awkward modifications that are, that are difficult to achieve. Revised cable card rules are therefore needed for the near term as the Commission moves to implement the gateway device proposal by the end of 2012. 
Our witnesses today will speak to the barriers that we must overcome for TV viewers to realize the benefits of true set-top box plug-and-play capability. And I want to thank each of them for joining us here this morning. We will turn to your testimony shortly. That concludes my opening statement, and I'm pleased to recognize now the ranking Republican member of our subcommittee, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome all of our witnesses this morning. The FCC issued their broadband plan, which is almost 400 pages. The font was about eight font, uh, eight point. And so you go to page 49, there's a little paragraph called 4.2 devices. So you read through that, get a little further along, you get to the recommendation 4.1212. Now, you don't think too much about it, but you read through it and you realize it has huge implications. And that's why our witnesses are here. And this is why this morning we're having this hearing. Um, the video marketplace is completely different today than it was when we passed the original set top box provisions in 1992 and 1996. Back then, my colleagues, cable providers served between 90 and 100 percent of subscription TV households. Today there is a robust video competition as evidenced by the fact that satellite and phone companies now serve one-third of subscription TV households. And the video market is only getting more and more competitive. Congress and the FCC need to be careful as it looks to impose the new regulations, and perhaps some of the recommendations are outlined in this recommendation 4.12. Being able to access the internet from a television isn't certainly an appealing idea to many consumers. As such, the market already seems to be delivering this service without any government assistance. According to the Consumer Electronics Association, in the next couple of years, every TV will be able to connect to the Internet wirelessly. In addition, industry analysts predict that more than 70 million Internet-connected TVs will ship in 2012, up from 15 million in 2009, and the number of such TVs in the U.S. will reach 80 million by the year 2013. Furthermore, we have seen that the reverse, people using their computers to watch TV shows and movies, is already a booming industry. Hula.com, for example, had almost a million videos viewed just in February. Congress and the FCC needs to tread very carefully, in my opinion, when attempting to impose technology mandates. Let the past be our guide. The FCC has been unsuccessful trying to artificially create set-top box competition through technology mandates for almost 20 years. Despite all of their regulatory efforts, the FCC concedes that attempts to manufacture a third-party device market have failed. Cable operators have been required to foist approximately 20 million cable cards at a cost of more than $1 billion on subscribers that elect to use operator-provided devices. Subscribers, on the other hand, have chosen to use only 500,000 cable cards with third-party devices. In response, most manufacturers have decided not to develop cable card devices. Part of the problem is that the subscription TV and device markets continue to develop rapidly. This has had two interrelated consequences. First, technology has outpaced the rules, making the inflexible cable card regime less than useful. Second, rather than buy set-top boxes and risk obsolescence, most customers rent from the cable operator and simply upgrade when cable operators roll out their new features, such as high definition, video on demand, and interactive services. Trying to artificially create set-top box competition by forcing subscription TV providers to support one size fits all gateway devices is unlikely to fare any better than similar attempts by the FCC through their technology mandates for the past 20 years. What the FCC could not accomplish when subscription TV was an analog, cable-centered, linear video platform will only be harder for a digital, interactive, internet-enabled video platform that's populated by diverse cable, satellite, and phone company architectures. And while the gateway device proposal stems from a national broadband plan recommendation, the question is how this mandate promotes broadband is not quite clear since most subscription TV households likely already have broadband. 
Making the government a gateway between providers and the customer is unlikely, in my opinion, to be productive. At best, micromanaging the devices providers must support will increase costs for consumers, hinder investment, and slow innovation. At worst, it is a veiled attempt to advance network neutrality and other regulations of that sort. The lack of set-top box competition in the past has not caused was was not caused by a market failure, but because there was no market. With the rise of alternative subscription TV providers in the internet, consumer needs are evolving. The market for third-party video devices is following suit. The FCC would do better to avoid mandates and allow current innovation to simply continue and to flourish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this hearing. I look forward to our witness. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on another important recommendation contained in the FCC's uh, National Broadband Plan. Um, as you know, I represent the heart of uh, Silicon Valley, and it's a place where many companies and industries live by the mantra, innovate or die. The issues of innovation and competition in the plan uh, reflect the legislative initiatives that I've pursued on behalf of my district uh, for many years. In 1996, when Congress passed the uh, Telecommunications Act, I partnered with my great pal, uh, Ed Markey, on including a provision, Section 629, to encourage innovation through competition in the set-top box market. In the 14 years since, we've only seen minor steps forward in creating new technologies. It's true that the cable industry did take it upon themselves to create cable card as a follow-up to the FCC's order to implement Section 629. But as the FCC recognizes uh, in its national broadband plan, quote, despite congressional and FCC intentions, cable cards have failed to stimulate a competitive retail market for set-top boxes. The FCC's recommendation to address this assessment is to have all multi-channel video programming distributors install a gateway device in subscribers' homes by December 31st in uh, uh, 2012. In the interim, they also recommend that cable operators fix the problems associated with cable card no later than October of this year. And that's not that far away. So I'm encouraged by the consumer principles recently released by the cable industry and their announced commitment to work with the FCC and the set-top box industry to create consumer choice and drive innovation. I'm interested to hear how the rest of the panelists uh, here today uh, think these principles will be applied. We haven't discussed uh, cable cards and set-top boxes in this committee for a number of years. Um, I remember the issue well. Uh, I just come on to the committee and uh, uh, so this is, it's important to revisit it so that we can leapfrog into the future. So I look forward to hearing from the, uh, all of the witnesses. And Mr. Chairman, again, thank you for uh, these hearings on uh, uh, the FCC's national broadband plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out uh, the problem. We have a national broadband plan. We need to map those areas that are unserved or they're underserved. And we need to use the market and our capabilities to make sure that everybody has at least a level of high-speed internet access. Um, and I don't get what, what the frustration or the un misunderstanding of the capitalist mar market is all about. Uh, it is the consumers who drive demand. Business then fills to meet the demand. It's a system that works. Every time we intervene and try to push a service on the public through government, we, we fail. Uh, listen, we've got, we've got video on watches. We've got video in automobiles. We've got video on phones. Uh, we get video over copper. We get video over cable. We get video over the air terrestrially. We get video over the satellite. We, we ought to be focusing on getting high-speed internet access to unserved areas and underserved areas. And that's where our focus should be and let the competitive marketplace meet the demand that the public wants to be met and not use government to force 
a demand in an area where, where the, the public is not going. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Shemkus. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'll give you a little known fact about myself. I, I like bands like Earth, Wind and Fire. And I'm going to tell you another secret. My LD Kenneth here likes to watch uh, Soul Train reruns, complete with vintage Johnson hair care product advertisements on demand. And uh, much to our delight, our respective cable companies offer those services. But the only way I can fill my house back in Pittsburgh with the hippest trip in America is with a cable box provided by the cable company, not from a box or a TV I could purchase at retail. Even if I think that box gives me a better user experience and has features that I find useful, like maybe internet connectivity. Now, according to the Census Bureau, 30 percent of Americans have never used the internet, but 99 percent of Americans have a television and over 85 percent of Americans have some form of pay TV service. Those numbers overlap. I agree with Chairman Boucher on this issue, and I appreciate and respect his leadership, which is why I'm glad that the FCC's National Broadband Plan identified this as an issue that could help drive demand for Internet access. I look forward to a final rule fixing, uh, some issues with cable card technology, and I look forward to all the witnesses today talking about the FCC's notice of inquiry about how all devices can work with all video providers in the future. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. Um, I haven't had to worry about hair care products in quite some, <laughs> quite some time now, but, I, but I'm glad that you're still concerned. <laughs> the um, gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, is recognized for two minutes. Oh, he's no longer with us. The uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Boyer, uh, passes and will have two minutes added to his questioning time. And uh, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bonamac, is recognized for two minutes. Good morning, Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and distinguished panel. The subject matter before us today is highly complex. We are confronting issues surrounding how video entertainment is delivered to the American consumer and increased use of our television, <clears throat> television as, a, as a means of, of accessing the Internet. Both involve capital-intensive areas of our economy, and I think the FCC and Congress, Congress should proceed with extreme caution. At the outset, I would like the record to express my support for policies that provide individuals and companies with the freedom to innovate. Such freedom allows uh, bright minds to develop products like, products like video on demand and DVR. Therefore, beyond the equal application of existing laws and regulations, I am weary of the government mandating technical standards beyond Section 629 or the regulations surrounding the Commission's implementation of that law. In addition to my concerns surrounding technical mandates, I also would like to remind the Committee about the importance of content protections. Few people are, inter are investing in set-top boxes to watch hearings like this one on C-SPAN, no matter how exhilarating we might think this discussion ultimately is, um, especially with Mr. Doyle's admission of earth, wind, and fire. But consumers want a complete viewing experience that maximizes the capabilities of, of the technology they have purchased. The viewing experiences of the consumer are the work of a large number of people who have to get paid. The only way they get paid is when their content is protected and sold, not stolen. As such, the manufacturers of set-top boxes play a vital role in the delivery and protection of content. I believe that no matter how we ultimately move forward, the protection of content should remain a high priority. To further make this point, I would like to submit a letter from the Motion Picture Association of America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to today's discussion, and I yield back the balance of time. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Bonamac. And without objection, the letter you have uh, mentioned will be made a part of our record. The um, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. Uh, back in 1993, when I was chairman of the subcommittee, I worked with uh, Jack Fields on the National Communications Competition and Information Infrastructure Act, uh, H.R. 3636. And like the National Broadband Plan's recommendation on set-top boxes, our bill was designed to unleash competition and innovation in the retail marketplace, enabling consumers to buy the set-top box of their choice, independent of their network provider. The bill passed the House overwhelmingly in June of 1994, 423 to 4, but it wasn't until the next Congress that the set-top box language was included 
uh, as a Bliley-Markey amendment uh, incorporated into the 1996 Telecommunications Act, becoming Section 629 of the statute. In the age of the smartphone, we can think of these devices now as smart video boxes, the converter boxes, set-top boxes, modems consumers use daily, the devices that ideally would help them navigate to the video and information sources of their choice. Fourteen years is an eternity in telecommunications policy. We might as well be talking about the Peloponnesian Wars or the last time the Bruins won the Stanley Cup. Uh, but it is clear, however, that over the last 14 years, the promise of the smartphone box provision has not been fulfilled. While there have been tremendous innovations in two of the three main devices for connecting to broadband services, smartphones and personal computers, the set-top box has been the box that time forgot. It is simply not as smart or as available as it should be for consumers. And that's about to change with the April 21st issuance of the Notice of Inquiry and a further Notice of Proposed Rulemaking as recommended by the National Broadband Plan, the FCC is now beginning to seek ways to effectively implement Section 629 from 14 years ago to give greater choice to consumers and increase broadband adoption. So this is going to be a huge change. It will make the consumer king, which should be our goal. Just get out of the way, let them have a technology that lets them go anywhere they want to go, do anything they want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. We're on the dawn of a brand new and, I think, best era we've ever had in telecommunications. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch, is recognized for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll pass. Thank you very much, Mr. Welch, and we will add two minutes to your time for questioning our panel of witnesses today. Uh, all members have been recognized for their statements, and we're now pleased to turn to our panel of witnesses, and we thank each of you for your attendance here this morning. Uh, Mr. Michael Williams is the Executive Vice President and General Counsel of Sony Electronics, Mr. Kyle McSlaro is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Mr. Matthew Zinn is the Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer for TiVo. Mr. Eric Shanks is the Executive Vice President of Entertainment at DirecTV. Mr. Harold Feld is the Legal Director for Public Knowledge. And Mr. David Young is the Vice President of Federal Regulatory Affairs at Verizon. Each of these gentlemen is deeply knowledgeable about the matter that we are discussing here uh, this morning, and we want to thank all of you for uh, coming and joining us and sharing your views with us. Without objection, your full prepared written statements will be made a part of our record. We would welcome your oral presentations and ask that you try to keep those to approximately five minutes, and that will give us ample time to exchange ideas and, and ask questions of you. Mr. Williams, we'll be happy to begin with you, and I would ask that you pull your microphone as close to you as you can. I think even closer than that would be good. Uh, we can hear you much better. Be sure you've turned it on. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Boucher. Ranking Member Stearns and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for allowing Sony Electronics this opportunity to testify on this very important issue. Sony is here today to lend its support to the FCC's National Broadband Plan and specifically to the gateway device proposal it describes. When implemented, it will bring consumers better value and a nearly infinite number of choices for news, information, and entertainment. The gateway device will allow true competition among content owners, service providers, and device manufacturers like Sony. And we all know where there is true robust competition, prices drop and services improve. The concept of an MVPD gateway is not something new or revolutionary. In fact, this service model has been discussed among device manufacturers in the MVPD community for many years. 
The gateway concept is a natural evolutionary step in the progression of television viewing. For the first 50 years, what we might call TV 1.0, consumers received video through one national standard that applied to all over-the-air broadcasters. It was easy to use, it worked well, and it allowed for a host of innovation and competition in the television receiver market. Starting in the 1970s, we entered into TV 2.0, the MVPD age, first through cable, then satellite, and most recently, telephone companies. TV 2.0 expanded consumer choice from a handful of channels to hundreds, and the technologies evolved from one to many, but it came with a price, the lack of interoperability. Now, we're at the dawn of TV 3.0, a confluence of the internet and traditional MVPD services. TV 3.0 will leverage the power of the internet to enable consumers to tailor their television viewing in ways we can only imagine. It will enable viewers to interact with the program they receive and with each other. More importantly, it will give consumers the tools they need to manage their programming choices to get what they want, when they want it, and to decide where they will view it. Now you may ask, what does this new TV 3.0 world have to do with set-top boxes? Why do Congress and the FCC need to be involved? The answer, we look back when we change from TV 1.0 to 2.0. Over-the-air broadcast relied on a single nationwide standard to transmit a television signal from the station to the viewer. In the MVPD age, there is no single nationwide transmission standard. Every cable operator, every satellite operator uses something different. Consumers typically subscribe to one MVPD provider, and they don't want to spend the extra money to buy a device that can receive every one of these many different signals. The genius of this universal gateway device and its approach is that it combines the best of both worlds and dramatically facilitates the integration of internet delivered video and data along with traditional MVPD services. Simply put, the gateway device is a translator. It takes the transmission signal from the service provider and translates it into an output signal that all retail consumer devices can understand. Now, there are other elements that are necessary for the gateway approach to work. First, consumer devices, such as televisions, need to operate on a level playing field against each other, which requires the use of a common national standard. Second, in order to provide an innovative consumer experience, the device needs to be able to tell the consumer what content is available and how to access it. Third, the output from the gateway device must be simple and open, like the existing Wi-Fi or USB standards. This output standard should not come with extraneous licensing or technical obligations that would hinder innovation, impair widespread implementation, and offer consumers little value. It's clear there are details that need to be filled in, but the committee should understand that the technologies necessary to implement this gateway device are in wide use today and have existed for many years. Sony believes the gateway device is a workable solution to implement the congressional mandate contained in Section 629. All of us, this committee, the FCC, the service providers, content providers, manufacturers and consumers have a stake in bringing television into its third age. Sony is convinced that the Commission's gateway proposal can and will succeed for all stakeholders and we look forward to joining these stakeholders to make TV 3.0 a reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. McSlaro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stearns, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. First, let me just state at the outset, we are very supportive of the direction the FCC is going, both with its notice of inquiry and the NPRM. We think what they presented uh, is a very thoughtful um, case for innovation that ties together really two strands uh, that I think it's worth taking just a moment to, to unpack. The first strand, as you've identified, Mr. Chairman, and others, goes back to Section 629, which is how do you create a retail, a competitive retail market for devices, not just set-tops, it could be televisions or other navigation devices. 
that marketplace hasn't taken off. It hasn't taken off principally for two reasons. One, cable cards were functionally deployed at a time in one-way devices at a time when the world was turning two-way. So you have one-way devices with cable cards and there really is no consumer demand for one-way devices. Really at this moment in time, TiVo is really the only remaining successful player in that field. The second reason it didn't take off is pretty obvious. Right now cable cards with the exception of Verizon are only used by cable companies and therefore if you buy a device that's a cable card device you can't actually take it to another competitor in, in today's world in 2010 four out of ten consumers take a multi-channel video service from somebody other than a cable company. The second strand is what was really identified in the broadband plan which is totally apart from whether or not there's a retail market what do we do, what are the opportunities and challenges of, of integrating television and video on the internet? And I think what they've tried to do is, is put those two together uh, in a way that we're, we're actually very intrigued by. Now I think there are a lot of unanswered questions and to be fair to the FCC, they've teed up most of those questions which is why they started with an NOI. Um, but I think our role in terms of the cable industry is to think about not so much the past, but what the opportunities are for the future. And to that end, as Ms. Eshoo uh, uh, said, we actually submitted to the FCC and to the subcommittee uh, a set of consumer principles. What, what are the goals here? Now, we've identified a couple that we think everybody should be able to sign up to. One, we do think consumers ought to be able to connect devices uh, to their multi-channel video service without a leased set-top box. They ought to have a retail market. Number two, we think the consumers ought to be able to take those devices they do purchase at retail and move them from one provider to another, which promotes competition. Third, we think that consumers should have the option of being able to access the internet, in particular to access internet video. Fourth, we think they, more than that, they ought to have the ability to search across all of the platforms so they can identify video on whatever the multi-channel service is providing, whether it's a video on demand or a linear channel or YouTube or Netflix or some other service uh, that's emerging on the internet platform. Now the caution we have is that we are uh, skeptics of uh, te government technology mandates. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be at the table doing the hard work necessary to try to achieve those goals. And we've committed to the FCC and we commit to you that we will do that. There's still a host of issues uh, that are unanswered. We've actually conceptually talked about ideas like the gateway device that Mike was just talking about a, a moment ago. Um, I'm not sure a gateway device is fully fleshed out right now. At a conceptual level, there should be some interface that we ought to be able to work toward that allows us to accomplish those goals. Um, but there are still enormous issues related to content protection, a lot of the promotional, transactional, and advertising issues surrounding each of these platforms. We obviously, we have other providers here today. We have different technology platforms. How we make that seamless is still a challenge. Um, but I think, as Mike said a moment ago, the technologies probably exist. Uh, and if there's a will for all of the providers, the CE manufacturers, the content providers to work together with the FCC, I think we can achieve them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. McSlaro. Mr. Zinn, and please pull that microphone very close. Thank you. <clears throat> as far as it can go. Chairman Boucher and Ranking Member Stearns, thank you for inviting TiVo to discuss device competition and the National Broadband Plan. <clears throat> Consumers love TiVo products because they combine the ability to find, record, and play cable programming with the ability to find, record, and play broadband programming, Netflix, Amazon, Blockbuster, YouTube, all in one easy to use user interface. TiVo puts the consumer in charge of its own viewing schedule while respecting the rights and concerns of copyright holders. TiVo's ideas have been copied, though never equaled, by video service providers in their own lease boxes, yet TiVo boxes have never been placed on an equal footing with lease boxes in terms of access to programming, pricing, installation, and support. The cable card was designed by the cable industry itself so that a consumer need only turn on the product read two sets of numbers on the screen and call them into his local cable operator. 
These are being supported this way in a few systems around the country, but by and large, installation and support have been woefully inadequate. And even when cable card reliant devices have been supported, cable operators have been making channels unavailable to consumers who rely on these devices. Let me show you what I'm talking about in terms of access to cable programming. I can cue the slides. Here is um, a website, a website um, showing a channel lineup for a cable operator um, system in Utica, New York. Next slide. You can clear the uh, you can clear the website, and then you can search by programming package. So the next slide shows that we have searched by the programming package entitled Not Available on Cable Card. Funny title for a programming package that contains over 200 channels that are not available on Cable Card, according to this website. And the next slide shows what that, what's in that package. Well, there are a lot of movie channels that consumers are being told are not available on cable card. Next slide. No habla espanol on cable card. Next slide. HD movies, if you buy an HD box or you have an HD TV, you kind of want HD movies. Not available on cable card. Next slide. Sports, anybody like sports? Not available on cable card. Next slide. 21 of the top 25 top rated channels in HD are not available on cable card, according to the website. My point is not to pick on a particular cable operator or cable system, only to graphically show the unequal competitive situation for retail set-top boxes. The fact is, most of these channels may be accessed by TiVo boxes using a tuning adapter, yet there's no mention of that here. No mention of switch digital, no mention of tuning adapter. All the consumer sees is not available on cable card, and most consumers would look at that and say, I'm not going to buy a retail box. Is it any wonder why more people lease boxes than buy retail boxes when confronted with this situation? And even if you get past the programming issue, then you have pricing issues. How much is a cable card? Do I have to pay for a lease box and a cable card? And then there are installation issues, which are now legendary. Faulty cards, untrained installers, installers who fail to bring cable cards or are not familiar with them, multiple truck rolls to do a single install, and so on. Fortunately, Congress anticipated that video service providers might foreclose device competition and innovation. The Consumer Electronics Availability Act of 1995 directed the FCC to assure in its regulations the commercial availability of competitive devices for multi-channel video programming providers. This subcommittee's bill became Section 629 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act. After many years of intermittent and inconsistent efforts to foster video device competition, Chairman Janikowski proposes to really advance the ball here in two provisions, two proceedings. <clears throat> First is a rulemaking to allow products such as TiVos, which rely on cable cards, to work on cable systems free of technical handicaps. And the second is a notice of inquiry to consider a gateway for competitive and innovative products to operate on cable, satellite, telephone, video systems, much as personal computers, and portable products operate over Wi-Fi connections today. My earlier slides show that cable operators have recently made ordinary subscription channels unavailable to competitive products, even though our customers must continue to pay for them. Cable operators do this with a switch digital technique in which certain of these channels must now be electronically requested from the head end. TiVo devices have the capability to send the necessary requests to the head end using broadband but TiVo's license from Cable Labs does not allow our products to be configured to make these simple requests, and cable systems currently are not set up to receive them. A regime in which a cable subscriber is required to use an operator-provided set-top box to receive a significant amount of programming is the very antithesis of what a competitive set-top box policy is designed to achieve. We are encouraged that the NCTA has recognized this in its statement of principles to Chairman Janikowski, and we look forward to working with Cable to address this critical issue. We applaud Chairman Janikowski for proposing these solutions. In summary, Mr. Chairman, Cable Card is not hard to fix, and we're not asking for much. We're asking for installation support, which is in the law. We're asking for pricing transparency and non-discrimination. And we're asking for upstream signaling so that retail boxes have regular cable programming without an operator provided set top box. All of these are what was supposed to be provided by the plug and play agreement that was signed into law in 2003. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zen. Mr. Shanks.
Eric Shanks. Eric, please turn your mic on. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Eric Shanks, Executive Vice President of Entertainment at DirecTV, and thank you for allowing me to testify today. To foster innovation and increase broadband adoption, the FCC is considering a plan to stimulate a retail market for smart video devices. While DirecTV supports the goal of innovation and broadband adoption, we have concerns with this proposal. Specifically, the FCC may require cable, satellite, and other video providers to develop an all-video adapter, whose sole function is to connect its service with third-party devices. Manufacturers of these devices could strip out our service and replace it with their own. This government intervention is both unnecessary and harmful. Innovation and the convergence of broadband and TV are prevalent in the market today and growing. DirecTV is driving this effort by including Ethernet ports on all of our HD boxes and access to some of the most popular Internet sites like Flickr, Facebook, and Twitter. By ignoring what is occurring in the market today, the proposal will have the opposite effect of what it intends. It would give cable a clear competitive advantage. It would place our innovative services at risk and result in increased costs and inferior customer service. We built our business nearly 20 years ago through innovation, and it's imperative that we do even more today to remain competitive. In the last 15 months alone, we've downloaded 76 new features to our set-top box. We do more than simply transmit plain vanilla programming. The features and services you are about to see create the video experience that is unique to DirecTV. Please roll the video. Should I go on and come back to the video later? There we go. It's a silent movie. I assure you we do give our customers audio. <laughs> Just not Congress, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Also access the internet using your direct TV remote, allowing you to stream internet radio. Navigate your way to sites like Flickr and YouTube, right on your television. QuickTune, a customizable guide that lists up to nine of your favorite channels with instant access to any one of them. TV apps, real-time personalized applications that keep viewers up to date on an endless variety of subjects, easily accessible by remote. Direct TV multi-room DVR service. When you connect an HD DVR to your HD receivers, every room is its own virtual DVR. Direct TV on demand. Use your remote to easily search, select, download, and watch all your favorite shows and movies on your schedule. With abilities, the best television experience in the world is on Direct TV. So everything you just saw resides in our set-top box. Under the proposal, however, we cannot ensure that these features or any future innovations would work with third-party boxes. Thus, consumers are left with three choices. One, pay for a new box from DirecTV. Two, settle for an incomplete service that they expect to get. Or three, switch to a provider whose technology is more suited to an all-video device. Although we don't advocate an all-video adapter mandate for any service provider, Cable's two-way architecture allows it to place its intelligence in the head end rather than the home. This means its services will still work with third-party devices. This, however, is not an option for satellite. Thus, the proposal would skew the competitive landscape toward cable, undermining the government's long-standing efforts to stimulate competition. In addition, allowing third parties to strip out our services that you just saw and develop their own user interface will diminish the industry-leading customer service they expect from DirecTV. When DirecTV first launched, there were hundreds of models of set-top boxes, each with their own controls and features. And frankly, we struggled to help subscribers handle even the most basic functions when they called us, such as setting parental controls or turning on closed captioning. This proposal would turn back the clock, leaving no clear lines of responsibility for customer service. We receive 140 million customer phone calls a year. 
including a great number regarding the set-top box. Who will take these calls, and more importantly, who will solve the customer's problems? We believe there are better ways for the FCC to achieve its goals without the potential harm to innovation, competition, and customer service. And fortunately, the FCC is willing to consider alternatives. DirecTV is already implementing one such solution. The RVU Alliance is a consortium of over two dozen distributors and manufacturers that have developed an open standard for in-home networking capabilities that allow subscribers to watch content anywhere in the home, on any device, whether from any pay TV provider or the internet. With our view, everyone is free to innovate and provide unique services, which accomplishes our shared goals. It fosters innovations, integrates broadband and video, eliminates the need for multiple set-top boxes, and creates devices that could work with different video providers. DirecTV is eager to work with the FCC and with Congress to achieve the shared goals of innovation and broadband adoption. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Shanks. Mr. Feld. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stern, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Harold Feld, and I'm legal director for Public Knowledge. My organization, joined by other consumer and public interest groups, asked the FCC as part of the National Broadband Plan to adopt a universal gateway for set-top boxes and video devices. Two of those organizations, Consumers Union and Media Access Project, joined us in the written testimony submitted today describing how a universal video gateway referred to in the FCC proceeding initiated last week as a setback box or all vid device will benefit consumers and further our national broadband plan. We believe that such a device applied across all MVPD platforms would promote innovation in the device and service market, enhance competition among MVPDs, and help spur adoption of broadband by increasing the value proposition of broadband to consumers. We also believe that the circumstances in today's market, as MVPDs are increasingly offering triple play packages of video and voice and data, Cable is undergoing a digital convergence, and the ferment of VC interest in making online video available on every screen creates a perfect opportunity for the FCC to reboot its implementation of Section 629. As the FCC recognized in the recent notice of inquiry, the proposed all-vid approach could do for this generation of devices what the FCC's historic Carter phone decision and subsequent rulemakings did for the phone network saving consumers monthly rental fees, opening up a new universe of equipment choices, and finally creating the opportunity for unforeseen innovations such as the modem and the dial-up internet. I want to make three points. Choice and competition in video devices is good policy. As everyone knows, you can attach any device and run any application on your broadband connection at home, whether it's an Apple, a Dell, an HP or an energy saving device that lets me adjust my home thermostat remotely, I can attach it to my home broadband connection. My mother and my mother-in-law could have video calls with what I believe is their favorite grandson, and it doesn't matter that I have Fios, my folks have RCN, and my in-laws use Comcast. The equipment all functions the same. This didn't happen by accident or because providers wisely arrived at this result through self-regulation. It happened because more than 40 years ago, the FCC found in a decision called Carter Phone that customers had a right to attach devices to the phone network. By setting a few simple ground rules, the FCC created the world of today in which consumers enjoy devices and services impossible to imagine when it decided Carter Phone. With this experience in mind, Congress, first in 1992 and then in 1996, required the FCC to create such ground rules for video devices. Nearly 15 years later, consumers are still waiting. My second point, the FCC's attempt to implement the law through cable card has not worked. Cable card has not lived up to its promise. Others here can speak more directly to why cable card failed in that promise. In general, we believe, as the name cable card implies, the FCC simply delegated too much to the cable industry. Cable card works for cable. It does not plug and play for consumers. It does not work with UVerse or other IPTV. It is not required on DBS, and it does not play well with Fios. The FCC further undercut cable card adoption by granting countless waivers, including waivers for so-called low-cost, low-functionality boxes that undercut adoption. As a first step, the FCC needs to fix cable card. Many consumers and competitive devices rely on it, but we need a fresh approach that is easy to use for consumers and promotes competition and innovation. My third point, the video gateway is the best solution to implement the law, promote consumer choice, and promote broadband. 
All MVPDs should provide consumers with a simple device that communicates with the MVPD network and makes MVPD services available to third-party devices. This will bridge the gap between closed MVPD networks and open home media e ecosystem. It will open up all subscription TV networks to device competition. It is a win for consumers, for consumer electronics and retail industries, and ultimately for the MVPD industry as well. As we saw with Carter Phone, opening up the phone network for new devices created new opportunities for the uh, telephone network providers to sell new services that they would never have developed without device entrepreneurs stimulating demand. Only the video gateway model will help fulfill the goals of the national broadband plan in promoting adoption as well as just deployment. As Mr. Doyle observed earlier, between 85% and 90% of Americans rely on some form of MBD, and almost all Americans have a television set. But only 60% of Americans have broadband in their homes. By approaching broadband adoption through the media device most familiar to all Americans, their television set, we can help bridge the digital divide and make broadband for all Americans a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Feld. Mr. Young. Chairman Boucher, Ranking Member Stearns, and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you on what is obviously a very important issue to the chairman and this subcommittee, and has been for a long time. Uh, and the reason I believe it's been important is because uh, this is an issue that uh, you believe will drive competition, innovation, and consumer choice. Um, which was certainly desperately required when first visited in 92 and even again in 96. But a lot has changed since then. In, uh, it's been less than five years that uh, Verizon first began offering Fios TV service to the residents of Keller, Texas. And uh, our three million subscriber base is small compared to our cable and satellite competitors, but we're playing big. And our innovations in the marketplace are forcing our larger competitors to respond to us. Uh, we've built, uh, spent $23 billion building uh, an all-fiber-to-the-home network that's capable of delivering the fastest broadband speeds, and we've integrated the best of digital cable technology with Internet Protocol to provide the best video experience possible. We've also introduced a number of uh, service innovations. We're the, the first multi-room DVR. We were the first to provide a media manager service that allowed content from your PC, pictures, and music to be played through your television set. Um, and we brought something to the market called widgets. And these widgets are applications that run on our set-top boxes. Uh, the first ones that we brought were traffic and weather. Uh, and these are still very popular ones. Uh, but we were the first to bring Twitter and Facebook to the TV. And these turned television watching into a true social media experience. We've brought uh, other ones like the NFL Red Zone that allows you to have an interactive multimedia sports experience rather than just watching uh, programming on, on the TV. And just this week, we announced our YouTube and iHeartRadio apps so that you can access all of the YouTube content or tune into thousands or uh, hundreds of radio stations from across the country. And all of this is through the least set-top boxes that our customers have today. But we're not the only ones doing this. If you walk into any Best Buy or other big box store, you'll find lots of innovative smart video devices available. These are devices like the Xbox or the Wii or the PlayStation. They're smart TVs, they're Blu-ray players, uh, they're specialized boxes. Some call them internet media adapters or net top boxes like Apple TV or Roku. And of course, PCs, laptops, uh, netbook, netbooks and uh, tablet computers. All of these are able to access video content over the internet and bring that experience to a customer's television set. Um, and so from these devices, you can access Netflix, you can access YouTube, Amazon, Major League Baseball, and more. So there is a actually robust retail navigation device market. Uh, the problem is that these same devices can't be used to access your subscription TV programming, and that's what we're all trying to figure out. That, of course, was the vision behind Section 629. It's the vision behind the FCC's notice of inquiry. And it's the reason that we have been reaching out to our CE partners and trying to demonstrate proof of concept uh, uh, um, prototypes that demonstrate that their CE devices could work with our service without the need for a leased set-top box. It's also why 
Verizon has taken a leadership position in a number of standard setting bodies to help develop the standards to make all of this possible. So we believe that this is achievable, um, but we have concerns about the specific proposal in the FCC's notice of inquiry. Uh, we think that a gateway model imposed on all technologies um, is not necessarily the best way to go. It's certainly not the only way to go. Uh, and we think that it risks repeating some of the uh, mistakes that were made in the past in the implementation of cable card. So what is the right way to achieve success? Any policy framework needs to recognize consumer choice. Consumers. Some consumers prefer to lease a box and let somebody else buy it and maintain it and take care of it. Others would prefer to buy the box and, and use it, uh, own it themselves. And, and so any solution should ensure both of those things. Any solution should encourage collaboration. Collaboration between the device makers and the service providers is important because it can improve the experience for the customer. It can help avoid problems by making sure that every detail is taken care of in advance. And if things do break, as they often do, it ensures that there's a way of getting that problem resolved without leaving the customer stuck in the middle with two parties pointing fingers at each other. We have to ensure that the MVPD experience is delivered to the customer the way the customer expects it to be delivered and that they're getting everything that they pay for. And then finally, this, this, I, I think all of this goes to creating the right fit framework that will promote continued innovation, competition, and consumer choice without repeating the mistakes of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Young, and thanks to all of our witnesses for your thoughtful and informed comments this morning. We have benefited in our understanding of the issue from the information you've provided. Mr. Shanks, let me begin my question with you. You represent DirecTV uh, this morning, and, uh, and I hear two basic concerns being expressed by you. Let me see if there's a way to address these consistent with the FCC's proposals. Uh, the first thing that I, I've heard you say is that uh, you are concerned that you're in a very different situation from cable, that cable can place uh, a lot of the uh, functionality interfaces in the local cable head end. You have to build those into your box because given the constraints of a satellite, you can't place uh, those interfaces in the satellite. So you have to do that in the box itself. And you're concerned that if it's not exactly your box that your consumer is using, some of that functionality could be lost. Uh, would it serve your purpose and satisfy that concern if you uh, were able, under the FCC's eventual order, uh, to be able to build the essential functionality that you have to have into your gateway device? You could still keep it simple, the primary goal of the device would be the standardized output signal that could be received by and processed by competitively available navigation devices. But you could enhance it to the extent necessary in order to include that vital functionality that you have to provide for your consumer experience. Is that a possible solution? Uh, as we understand it today, uh, no, in the sense that the the third-party devices um, at the handoff point of a gateway uh, can pick and choose um, what to do with the content. So, well, I think that I think you're you're going going to the second part of your concern. Let's stick with the first part. I'm going to address the second part in just a moment. So, the first part is simply this: if you put that functionality that you have to build into your boxes today into the gateway device itself, why doesn't that solve the problem? Uh, that gateway device would be our set-top box. Well, it wouldn't necessarily have to go that far. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't have to do all the various things that your set-top box does at the moment. It would just be the essential things that the cable company builds into its head end that you, by necessity today, have to put into the set-top box. And I believe that um, you know, the service that is sold from DirecTV, which is a service which comprises of all of the things that you know, we displayed in the video. Um, the only way that satellite can actually get that service is by a completely seamless and disaggregated uh, chain of satellite, set-top box, and remote control to the television set. Um, so that gateway 
would have to include, I mean, we, we actually don't build unnecessary things into our set-top box because we don't want to increase costs. So it's as simple as we can make it today. Um, well, all right, I, I hear what you're saying. Let me ask that you give serious consideration to this possibility because uh, the Commission is on track, and I think properly, and many of the witnesses here have said properly, uh, to develop the gateway uh, box as, as the bridge as the way to make sure that you really can have this competitive market for set-top boxes. And um, it, it seems to me that if you enhance that set-top box with whatever is absolutely essential for you to have in it, comparable to what the cable company puts in its local cable head end, and leave all the other functionality for the con competitive set-top box itself, that the problem potentially is solved. And I would just ask that you give careful thought to it going forward. Yes, sir. Second part of your concern was this. Uh, you said that you are concerned that some of the unique functionality that you offer that makes DirecTV special could be stripped out by that competitive provider of a navigation device and therefore deprive your customer of that unique experience. Uh, would it not be a simple answer to that concern if the FCC, as part of its rule, basically says that all of the services provided by the multi-channel video distributor would have to be passed through and processed by and made available to the consumer from these competitively available navigation devices? Um, there's two concerns with that. Number one, that innovation is clearly happening today. Um, Sony Bravia Television, we hand off our signal. The complete DirecTV service is included in the Sony Bravia. Well, television. let me just see if I can get a direct answer to the question because my time is limited. Okay. Um, would that not be a satisfactory way to handle it? The Commission would require that the very concern you're expressing here, uh, in, in fact, not, not become a reality because that box would have to process and make available all of your functionality. Uh, so that would just get to my second point, which is. Uh, oh, that is the second point. Customer service, exactly, which is. You know, the ability to be able to troubleshoot and who is going to call DirecTV if the interface is completely hijacked from DirecTV, and that's a problem that we've had in the past. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. McSlara, let me turn to you. Thank you very much for Cable's very constructive uh, statement of principles. Uh, those have been uh, presented uh, very well by you this morning, and I want to just make reference to the first one for purposes of a question to you. Uh, that first principle says that consumers should have the option to purchase set-top boxes at retail that can access their cable company's video services without having to have a set-top box that is supplied by that cable provider. And that certainly speaks directly to the goal that we're here trying to achieve this morning. Uh, can I read that statement as suggesting that the cable industry would also support taking the steps that are necessary to make sure that the switched uh, video services, uh, the digital switched video services that many cable companies are now beginning to offer with, as uh, Mr. Zen suggested, uh, hundreds of channels now being provided in switched digital video that cannot at the present time be accessed through cable cards. Uh, would you support the steps consistent with this first principle that would enable those switched digital video services to be accessed through cable cards uh, so that companies like TiVo uh, would be in a position to uh, record uh, those programs as, as well as others? Yes, and in fact, in uh, 2007, Tom Rogers, the CEO of TiVo, uh, called me and asked me to help him address this issue. And in fact, at the end of 2007, Tom and I made an announcement where the cable industry made a commitment to supply tuning adapters to any TiVo customer uh, so they could access switched uh, channels. Now, it's not a perfect system, um, but we've already shown our willingness and, and our commitment to meet that obligation. I, I appreciate that statement. Let me just suggest that the way that I think it's being done today is somewhat awkward and it involves using a bulky um, tuning adapter, um, which is itself as large as a set-top box, and it's difficult to connect and utilize. What Mr. Zinn is uh, proposing is that the cable company 
um, allow uh, a request uh, to be sent upstream by way of the broadband network. And it would seem to be a fairly simple matter for uh, the cable company to accept that request and have it uh, acted upon electronically. Would, would you agree that that's an appropriate request and would your companies honor it? So um, I, I would have described the tuning adapter as minuscule and elegant, but... Um, <laughs> I've, I've, ac I've actually seen one and it's, it's, a, it's as big as a set-top box, at least the uh, one I saw was. Okay, large and elegant. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I think Mr. Zinn, Mr. Zinn the, the has, has one here, by the way. He, he can there, show there. us just how large it is. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. All right. Go ahead, man. That, 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 that's Have it. Field day. See, oh, no. it's actually smaller than a set-top. Um, <laughs> The IP back channel is a legitimate issue. The problem we have right now at the moment is that what TiVo has asked for is a proprietary IP back channel solution where they're working with C-Change. We are actually open to and have told the FCC we're open to exploring an IP back channel so you can signal upstream to the head end. That's an open standard that would be available to any uh, consumer electronics manufacturer who wants to avail it, not just one company. All right. My time has long expired, and the chair will be generous with other members as they uh, propound their questions. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you for those answers. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stearns. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just ask each of you a question. Just give me a yes or no answer. Should the FCC adopt the current uh, gateway mandate as currently proposed? Mr. Williams? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Ms. Claro? I don't know. Just yes or no? I, 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 there is no gateway proposal. It's a concept. I don't know. Well, um, do you support uh, the FCC's commission? Do they think they're on the right track? I think they're on the right track, but they're exploring it. It's just an NOI. So you, you think they're on the right track? Mr. Zinn, now the first question is, should the FCC adopt the current gateway mandate as currently proposed? Yes or no? I agree that they're on the right track. I also agree with Kyle that it's an NOI and <clears throat> there's no concrete proposal at, at the uh, current time. So you think when they talk about the recommendation of 4.12, that's not a that's not a uh, proposal? It's a concept, and I agree with the concept. And so you, I, uh, you don't, you don't yes. see it as a mandate as at all. Um, actually, I don't see it as a tech mandate. I see it as a request um, for standardization. So it's a it's a definitional question: is a is a standard a tech mandate, or is a standard a standard? So you don't see the FCC's recommendation as any mandate at all, it's just talking about apple pie and cherry pie, apple pie and goodness, huh? That's how you see it? Yes. Okay, uh, Mr. Shanks? Uh, no, sir. Okay, uh, Mr. Field? Well, uh, well, to the extent that they ask whether- say yes or no. We filed a petition asking for a rulemaking on this, so we think, and they put that out as part of the NOI comments. So, so you're saying that. yes, you're a yes. Mr. Young? <laughs> No, I don't think the gateway proposal okay. as it stands. I, I think it's important just first of all to find out where you are on this basic question here. I noticed the two of you here wouldn't give me an answer and, and it seems a little more political your answer, frankly. I mean, I, I would think if you go back to your association members, uh, I think they're going to give you an answer to this and not quite as equivocal as the two you two just gave. Mr. Young, um, uh, the National Broadway Plan calls for a gateway mandate to kick in on December 31st, 2012. Uh, Mr. Zinn and Mr. Sclero, it's 2012, so that is a mandate in my opinion. But anyway, Mr. Young, so the question to you is, what do you think your companies will be accessible on third-party devices? Um, we are working very aggressively to make that happen well in advance of the 2012 deadline, uh, and we believe that it can be done without the gateway as proposed by the FCC. So we're encouraged that the NOI looks for alternative approaches because we believe we have one. Uh, do you think there'd possibly be a risk that the uh, 2012 mandate will slow down your existing work? Uh, that's certainly a possibility. Um, if the gateway approach must be adopted in a particular way by all providers, regardless of whether it's necessary, uh, that would certainly slow down our work. Okay. Uh, Mr. Shanks, uh, the same question to you is, uh, when do you think your companies will be accessible on third-party devices, and is there a risk possibly that this uh, government mandate 2012 will slow down your existing work? Um, uh, first of all, uh, the DirecTV service is available through open standards called DLNA today, so you can watch DirecTV on a PC or on a phone or any DLNA-enabled devices. You can do it on a PlayStation, Xbox? Uh, if they're a DLNA compliant open standard uh, 
Handheld uh, wireless devices too? Yes, sir. Digital recorders? Yes, sir. Okay. iPad? Uh, the iPad I don't think is DLNA, but we are, we, our Sunday ticket uh, application will work on an iPad, yes. Okay. Uh, and then I guess the, Mr. Uh, Mick Sclero, just the same question to you, possibly. Yeah, so I could probably meet your needs here. We're not for a mandate. We're willing to explore these concepts. So. Okay, but the 2012, your company will be accessible on third-party devices by 2012? We're already accessible to third-party devices. I think the question is whether or not there's going to be a marketplace that's a two-way marketplace. Okay. Mr. Shanks, can you explain why you believe the gateway device mandate will hurt your ability to innovate and compete? Um, you know, DirecTV as a service includes everything that, that you just saw, and we set customer expectations, and I think that that's been a big part of our success. Um, the issue we have with this is, number one, obviously it does give a clear advantage to cable because of their two-way pipe, and we only have a very large one-way pipe. Um, secondly, uh, you know, would uh, in the proposal any third-party device have to have kind of a a litany of exceptions of things that they don't get when they're buying the DirecTV brand. And because, you know, that box is obsolete the day that you buy it, uh, and we continue to upgrade, uh, like I said, 76 features in the last 15 months, and, you know, as Sony and other CE manufacturers know, 3D is the next big thing, apparently. Uh, we've given a free upgrade to all of our HD customers that will allow them to watch the World Cup in 3D starting June 11th and a third-party device, we have no assurance whether that customer who's think, who thinks they're getting DirecTV would actually be able to see 3D, and who would they call? It would be just confusion on a customer service level. Uh, Mr. Young, let's take a hypothetical. What happens if someone wants to introduce some sort of functionality that the FCC hasn't failed to consider, for example, or it doesn't work with the gateway mandate? Uh, do you perceive that the uh, you'll need FCC permission to, to change? I mean, how, how would that work? That, that's actually what I think is one of the significant flaws with the proposal as it, as it was written. And it's basically that all of the intricate functionality involved in providing our services would have to be standardized so that they could be made available through this gateway. That means that us and DirecTV and, and the cable companies would all have to do all of our services exactly the same way, um, and, and that would be locked in, and then there would be no ability to innovate or bring new capabilities uh, to our, our products because there would be no way of introducing new functionality outside of that standard that had been mandated. Mr. Shanks, do you agree, or would you like to comment? Um, no, I think we actually agree on most of those points. Mr. McSclero, do you I agree? agree? Pretty I much, pretty much, he said. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stearns. The general lady from California, Ms. Eshoo, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, this has been an instructive uh, panel in uh, terms of your testimony and your answers to uh, the questions that uh, members have already posed. Um, I, I just want to uh, make an observation, and that is that uh, I've read what the FCC is trying to do uh, as simply establishing a, um, uh, a standard protocol and that uh, that's not a mandate, and it seems to me that there is consensus on this panel with the exception, I think, of um, Mr. Shanks, I hope I'm characterizing it correctly, but uh, um, I think that's important to be stated. I, I, I don't think anyone here has uh, uh, been uh, directly or indirectly involved, uh, members that is of the committee, uh, in mandating technologies. Uh, but standards are very important. And uh, I think that when that is clear, that that serves people of the country well. And um, so I, I just wanted to start out with that. I apologize that in my opening statement I didn't make a special fuss in wel uh, welcoming Matt Zinn, uh, who's my constituent. And um, I'm proud uh, that he's here and testifying and uh, value his service. Uh, so let me start with you, um, Mr. Zinn. You've worked hard to make your technology uh, uh, compatible uh, with what the cable companies uh, have developed. Uh, can you... Um, uh, uh, tell us about uh, either your, um, uh, let's say, your, um, uh, your positive views of what you've heard uh, Kyle McSlaro talk about today 
or, or are there still some lingering uh, issues relative to TiVo uh, and um, uh, you know the plans for improving uh, the cable card? Well, I think the because biggest issue. I heard it. That, that's where you've had problems. <clears throat> right. I think the biggest issue is, as I showed in the slides, access to switch digital programming directly. You know, I showed the tuning adapter. Right. It's a set-top box. It was supposed to be a little dongle, um, but it turned into be a set-top box and um, a competitive box policy that requires a consumer to get a large number of channels by using a cable set-top box is the antithesis of a set up a competitive set up box policy. But do you in terms of what you've heard today in the discussion are you um, does that clear away some of the weeds relative to your uh, you know what you're what you just uh, said if there is follow through from the cable industry on creating an IP back channel solution that is not proprietary um, that would that would help greatly and then if there's follow through on clearing away some of the installation support issues. Um, Self-installation goes a long way. In California, um, in your district, Comcast actually does a pretty good job of allowing consumers to self-install cable cards, and it's mm -hmm. not that complicated. Right. I think there are ways to address this. I've even done it myself. <clears throat> there you go. Mm -hmm. um, and then pricing. Most cable programming is sold in packages, and in the packages, a set-top box is included. Now, if you bring your own set-top box, mm -hmm. there's no discount for bringing your set-top box. Mm -hmm. So I think that like cable modem service, a cable company either lets you lease a cable modem, mm -hmm. or if you buy a cable modem, they don't charge you for the cable modem. Great. I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, to Mr. McSlero, do you want to respond to that? Um, I, 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 I want to take this opportunity to thank you for what you're doing, because you recognize that uh, there are problems with the cable card, you're committed to uh, um, uh, changing that. Uh, uh, do you want to respond to Mr. Uh, some of Mr. Zinn's well, I, uh, comments I mean, just or to, views? Uh, first, thank you. Uh -huh. um, but just to play off and it. And I think the, uh, the, uh, the principles that you've come up with, as the chairman said, is really helpful. Well, thank you. I, mm -hmm. I, I think, as Matt was just talking about, I think we, ha we live in a cable card world today. Mm -hmm. There are issues that we need to address. We're committed to addressing them. But I think what's important in the takeaway of this hearing is what's the future like, right? Mm -hmm. How do we get out of that world? There's going to be a natural transition. It's going to be a two-way interactive world. Mm -hmm. It is going to integrate television and the Internet. Um, so we are committed to doing both, addressing the near-term fixes that need to be addressed while we work on the future. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, let me just uh, make another observation since I have 19 seconds left, and that is that I have no doubt that the uh, uh, 2010, the October 2010 date, uh, and what has to take place um, between now and then uh, will happen. Uh, it's what comes around the corner from that. And I, I think that's where uh, most of the work lies and the cooperation has to take place. So, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and again to all the witnesses. Thank you um, uh, for what you're doing, and um, uh, as uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Mr. Markey that this is one of the most exciting times uh, uh, for us, and I look forward to uh, um, people all over the country being part of that excitement and its services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Eshoo. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shemkus, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I don't know any member of Congress who has more guests to announce at, in a telecommunications a uh, high-tech committee than Anna issue. It seems like every time we have a high-tech hearing, Anna, you've got a constituent here. It must speak to your district, I would say. It does. <laughs> Thank you. Good guess. Yes. <laughs> so uh, welcome. Um, and I think what well, I just keyed on, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, the two-way interactive world. And the, the, the basic question is, who drives that the quickest? Government mandates, not a mandate, but government standards, which then moves to a mandate versus the market. That's all. Now, we believe in the market. Uh, I think when you look at the uh, handsets, the, uh, the, the telecom bill that was passed that kind of released innovation, that's why we all have a multitude of uh, things on our hips that can do a gazillion things that no one ever dreamed of. When we stayed controlled, we'd stay rotary. 
So th that's kind of the same thing. Now, when we want to get, now I have teenagers, um, so I'm already experienced how these kids are way advanced. And I don't understand how any of this stuff works. And I've been on the committee 14 years. Um, but I do know we have an Xbox 360. And we know that gaming has pushed new technology. And then the market placed a demand for interactive gaming online worldwide. So when one of my sons is playing Modern Warfare 2 or whatever these great games are, they're, they're, they're amazing. But when they team up, they could be playing with kids in Japan or South Korea. Now, Mr. McSolero, this is over our coaxial cable. Does the cable industry get any, any revenue other than the basic service fee for the, the cable connection? In most cases, no, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, I can't think of one. You buy the Xbox 360, you hook it up, and you can interact worldwide in a gaming situation. Now, the FCC didn't intervene, didn't tell the online game world and the high-tech community from Ann Ashby's district, make this happen. It was the consumer demand of gaming worldwide. And I, I, would just, uh, I would just end on that. I, I think it's compelling. It's, it's a compelling argument to remember that if, if we want to innovate, we, we let the market push us in. And when we start dictating, uh, we slow up the process. We don't speed up the process. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Shemkus. The uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, there, there's a difference between a tech mandate and tech standards. Uh, a tech mandate is seen as onerous, as you hear from several of my friends over there. A tech standard is a set of rules that lets others play on a common playground. So a tech standard's like the plain telephone jack that allowed my young daughter to want a Mickey Mouse phone. So Mr. Zinn and Mr. Williams, are, are you looking for a standard similar to that, or are you looking for a mandate? Um, if I could just chime in on that, um, what I would like to say to Mr. Shimkus before he took off was the reason that his children can do that is because of the internet protocol standard. And that is the same standard that the FCC is talking about for set-top boxes. Um, and Congressman Doyle, absolutely, it's the standard. You've hit the, the nail right on the head here because like we, as we know from the past, if we study the past, we know from the national standard, there was the National Television Standard Committee, and we had over-the-air broadcasting. Didn't mandate the technology of how the signal was processed. That was up to an individual station or broadcaster. What allowed is everyone had the same standard to transmit we had CBS, ABC, NBC compete with each other on the nightly news, and now uh, we're going to have the same thing in TV 3.0, the national standard. But again, how Sony is going to render the video content on the Internet or allow you to take the Internet and that data and interact with the services that you are buying from DirecTV or AT&T or Verizon, that's the brand new world that we want to see develop sure. through this standard. Not a technology mandate. We're not here for that. Very good. Uh, Mr. Feld, I'm curious about something that Mr. Young from Verizon raised in his testimony, uh, that we can achieve compatibility through open standards with a set of protocols that will allow retail devices to access video services from you know, either a cable or satellite company. How do you, how do you react to that? Well, um, what we have seen historically is that uh, we have the greatest uh, potential to achieve that when the FCC plays the role of an honest broker able to bring the industry together, avoid holdouts, push people, nudge, and stand above the financial interest that every vendor and every provider has. Uh, 
the internet protocol and the success we've had with that goes back to the dial-up modem, which goes back to the original Carter phone decision and the rulemakings that set that very basic standard. Um, we've seen the same thing in television, digital television. The wireless devices that uh, Mr. Shimka spoke of are all certified by the FCC. Uh, when the FCC does its job right and acts as an honest broker among the industry and makes it clear that there's no value in holding out for a proprietary or industry-specific solution, uh, we are able to have these sort of uh, protocols and the industry is then able to build on that so that having established the cooperation, the next generation comes much more easily to the industry. But it's getting over that hump to get the parties together, to push them to rise above their different interests and create a standard that really serves the consumers and the industry both and allows a market to develop where the FCC plays such an important role. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any other questions. I'll yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Doyle. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. appreciate you holding these hearings. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things I think that Mr. Shimkus brought up. Uh, <laughs> when in doubt, I have a 16-year-old and an 18-year-old. I call my kids because they, uh, they are a lot more tech savvy than us, and uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain to them the years of growing up uh, in Northwest Ohio when we had two channels and some days you got them and some days you didn't. And uh, all the different things that are out there today, it's absolutely uh, phenomenal what's uh, out there. And uh, I guess the, uh, one of the things that uh, I'd just like to ask, you know, right now we have a lot of the consumers out there that look forward to, you know, purchasing uh, and then installing the uh, different video navigation devices. But uh, what, do we, what about the consumers that, again, aren't as technically savvy and just want the cable tel uh, telephone satellite company to provide and install the navigation device? And uh, as you know, when we completed the DD, uh, DTV transition, we spent millions of making sure that people could install and set up and use their converter boxes. You know, I still go in a lot of houses today that the microwave light is blinking and that the uh, VCR is still blinking. So there's a lot of folks out there, again, that aren't uh, as quite uh, tech savvy as some of our, our the kids out there. And so, uh, you know, I guess uh, uh, if I could ask uh, Mr. Young, uh, is the FCC's all-vid proposal too focused on the technical elite at the risk of the, ri uh, at the rest of the population, especially the, uh, some of our older uh, Americans who are not as proficient in adapting to the new technology that's uh, provided to them? I think that there is certainly a risk of that if it goes a certain direction. Uh, I, I am hopeful that the FCC will not go in that direction in the NOI, but the way the, the, the mandates that come along with the FCC's all-vid adapter proposal, and it, it does go beyond just a standard. There are mandates there that say the vid adapter must do this, must not do that, and so uh, that would, if that was adopted like that, it would have a very negative consequence for that that uh, group of people. Well, let me follow up with that then. How do, how do we, uh, if something like this would be adopted, how do we get out there for those individuals that need help? Because again, you know, we, as we watched what happened with the transition not too long ago, we were sending out all this information about when, on TV, when things were being changed over with signal and uh, letting folks know that they'd have to have a converter box just you know, if you're, you want to get their regular antennas to work. But how, do, how would you foresee that we could actually get out there and do something? I think the best way to do that is to not disrupt what they're already buying and enjoying. I, I think that we can add support for these new devices without having to disrupt the least model that many people prefer. And so any solution, I think, should allow the customer to choose which they prefer. Um, and, and some customers will have a mixture of both, and, and that's a good thing. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Latta. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, very much. And uh, yeah, this, this really does go back to the uh, Cotaphone era and, uh, uh, and our attempts to make sure that uh, consumers are not denied uh, the opportunity to go out and buy their own phone. I remember when the CEO of uh, AT&T sat down here in 1979 and, and told us that if uh, someone could go out and buy their own phone that wasn't a black rotary dial phone, 
and plug it into that phone jack, it could bring down the whole phone system of Massachusetts. And uh, I actually did. I turned to Al Gore and I said, we've got to break these people up. Okay? This is ridiculous. Okay? How long will it take, Mr. Chairman, for you to be able to figure that out? Well, about 10 years. Maybe in 10 years we'll be able to have other phone companies able to have phones that are plugged into our phone jacks. So that was like a, a frightening thing to me, huh? Because we were all renting that black rotary dial phone for three bucks a month. Our mothers had done it for like 40 years, three bucks times 12, 36 times 40 years. That's like 1,400 bucks to rent that black rotary dial phone with no new device you can plug in yourself that you control, huh? So we come to this point now where we have this great opportunity to make it work, right? That consumers can plug their own devices in and make it uh, work. So what do you think, Mr. Shanks? What, what are the chances here that, uh, that you're going to be able to work this out so that, uh, so that people can buy a device that plugs into your device uh, and still allows you to, apply, to provide first class quality service for direct TV uh, customers? Uh, Mr. Barkey, I, uh, I, maybe I'm the only one in the, in the room that sees at least one big elephant, and it is the fact that no matter what television you buy today, you can plug it in and make sure it works, whether it's with Verizon or Comcast or Adelphia. There is a standard there, and the televisions now made by Panasonic, LG, Vizio, I looked up on Amazon today, 300 of them, um, they're all touting millions of websites that you can go to while you're watching DirecTV. With Panasonic, even, you can Skype with your grandma while you're watching DirecTV. You know what, though? Here's my point, okay? That I'm kind of a technological agnostic. I, I have no idea, okay? We're congressional experts are only experts compared to uh, other congressmen, but not compared to real experts, okay? That's just an oxymoron congressional expert, you know, like a jumbo shrimp bar you know, Chevy Chase nightlife, okay? There's just no such thing. So we need to make sure that, you know, we just have the most imaginative 17-year-old out there coming up with new ideas, which might not be Mr. Panasonic, it might not be Mr. anybody else, okay? That's the beauty of uh, this incredibly short road that we've traveled uh, in the last uh, 15 years. And as the author of Section 629, I, I've been waiting for the day where um, we were all liberated totally. We can just get out and buy the box of our choice and just plug it in there and make it work, you know? So, so are you going to work here with the FCC to make this possible for people to be able to have more control so it's just not, uh, you know, a kind of an impossible technical difficulty for you to be able to overcome? Yes, sir. I mean, we obviously are embracing open standards, broadband connectivity to our boxes, to television, so that anywhere in the chain, you can absolutely insert what television manufacturers are doing, um, what I actually was in Silicon Valley the other day. I saw an amazing set-top box from a very large Silicon Valley company, which was taking the DirecTV signal in via standard HDMI port. They put a complete browser over the top of it. And the cool thing with that was when the browser crashed, Right, which browsers we all know do, and you get that waiting for no, just, hourglass. Will you, you'll work it out, though. You'll yeah, work, we work it out. Okay, yeah, that's exactly. all I'm looking that's exactly for. Okay. What yeah, that I could, I, I know, I said there's going to be a lot yeah. of technical difficulties. Let me let me just move on quickly here. We're we're coming up to the 20th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and uh, there were some other impossible things that you know that uh, we just built into that law out of the subcommittee, including closed captioning for all television sets back in. Uh, 1990, I should have hear, heard the uh, consumer electronics industry on that one. My God, that was going to add 25 or $30 to every television set. Just very, very difficult. You have no idea, Congressman, how hard it will be to build that little thing. And, and how, you know, in bars across America, how could guys, you know, talk to women and watch the game if they didn't have closed captioning today? I mean, it's an essential part of our society, you know? So, um, and, and who would ever think of having a TV set without it in? So as we're moving forward, I, I actually, you know, introduced the Video uh, Accessibility Act kind of on this 20th anniversary to kind of totally modernize um, the access that the disabled community would have to, um, uh, to, um, to all this video voice, you know, data. So what do you think about that? You, you guys are familiar with the, the bill as I've introduced it. Mr. Young, can we incorporate that as part of this process that we're 
looking at right now? You raise a very important point because as video service providers, we have responsibilities and we have to ensure that those responsibilities are met regardless of the device that's used to access our service. And so, uh, yes, that is something that definitely needs to be considered. Great. You agree with that, Mr. McLaren? I do. And can we do that as part of this process? I think so. Yeah. Do you agree with that, Mr. Shanks? Yes, sir. It's, Mr. Yeah. Williams, could you get that done? Yes. Okay. That's beautiful. And uh, Mr. Zinn? I have no objection to that. No what? No objection to that. No objection. Beautiful. And Mr. Feld? I, I would just like to add that um, bringing the inventiveness of the thousands of potential entrepreneurs and developers who could come up with solutions in this through a gateway uh, so that we have um, all sorts of solutions, whatever works best uh, for the uh, disabilities community, uh, I think is an important part of opening up the set-top box as well to make things like this happen. So you're saying the more open the set-top box is the more likelihood that thousands of people, maybe with disabilities, will start to think about how they can use that, that device uh, to help millions of people across the country better access all of this information. The more people working on a problem and the easier it is for people to adopt the solution that other people develop, the more likely that problem is to be solved. With the exception of the United States Senate, okay? And I agree with that, okay? That's a, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not a, it's a, there are, all general rules have exceptions. So we, I, I do think that, um, that uh, we're really at the dawn of a, a tremendous uh, era here, and, uh, and uh, especially you, Mr. Shanks, would, I would appreciate if you could bring flexibility here to this process. It's been a long, long time, and, uh, and I think it would be great if consumers could uh, uh, just go down to their store and buy the device that they want, uh, and just to make sure, that, and obviously we want to have service uh, and maintenance issues uh, uh, dealt with um, by the by the service companies, but at the same time, um, consumer is king and queen, and the more that they're allowed to do that, I think the better off the whole industry is. I just think the more of these devices that will get sold and the more programming that will get wash, uh, watched and the more revenue that uh, each of your companies will be able to uh, garner. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Markey. The gentleman from California, Mr. McNearney, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Markey, for some interesting remarks there. Um, I, I was, I'll take uh, that as a compliment, I <laughs> hope. Uh, <laughs> um, Mr. Williams, uh, I was wondering, what is the state uh, of affairs with regard to a universal uh, gateway device? I mean, Sony must be developing something like that. Uh, are the challenges mostly technical or regulatory? Uh, where do we stand on that? The challenges are, in the sense, the current operating environment from the past where not all MVPD providers were uh, required to address the solution. The, the elegance and the beauty of this proposal that the uh, Notice of Inquiry embra em embraces is that it's an all MVPD solution. Telcos, satellite, cable are all at the table with the CE manufacturers and other groups. And the internet, because it's open standards, it's you know, well received, everyone understands the concept of common standards that allows the innovation to take place, it's moving along. But we need the framework to ensure that everyone has to play on the same field by the same rules. And that will allow innovation for all those people to figure out how's the best or the coolest way for you to interact with the TV programming that you're purchasing be it from AT&T, Verizon, uh, DirecTV, or Comcast. Well, this reminds me a little bit of football. I mean, you want a, a level playing field, and you want rules that everybody understands so right. that people don't get hurt, uh, so that the game can be played fairly. And, I mean, I think that's where we need to go. Uh, and what you're telling me is that once we get those sorts of rules in place, then the technology ought to take off. Is that? Ab absolutely. And we just have to look to when I was a child, we had three stations in Boston, Massachusetts, but they all broadcast on the same standard. They competed on the content. Right. In the television side, we all had to receive the same signal, but we went from tube TVs to transistorized TVs. One company decided to go with RCA color mask for color TVs. Yeah. We at Sony went a different way. We went with Trinitron. 
so no one mandated you have to use this technology to render color video. Sure. We d developed it, innovated, competed. And what happened? The price of televisions went down over time, and they're still going down. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McSlurrow, you, you gave a list of four goals. They seem pretty laudable. Are those widely shared, uh, in your opinion, the, the four goals that uh, you mentioned? Uh, um, there ought to be retail devices. The devices should be transferable. Uh, they should have access to Internet videos, and they should be search capabilities. Are those, in your opinion, universally shared goals? It depends which industry. Um, I mean, I think the goals are probably hard to disagree with them. I think, I think the proof of the pudding is going to be in what requirements are placed on different actors in the system to accomplish those goals. I and mean, we've been basically debating that point this morning. Um, but I think the one great opportunity that we have that's new today that wasn't present when the original 629 was, was enacted is that we, we live in a broadband age and the convergence is taking place and there are, you know, as others have made this point, you can go to Best Buy today and you can see devices today that do a lot of these things. So to some extent, we're accomplishing these goals today. It is probably also true that working together is and again, it doesn't necessarily require a mandate, but working together as providers, manufacturers, content creators, we might be able to come up with some kind of interface that makes this even easier and deploys even more quickly. Thank you. Um, Mr. Zinn, what specific proposals would you offer to benefit customers uh, to, be, uh, to have an early Im implementation uh, in, a, in, a, in a short time frame? Um. <clears throat> I'm not sure I understood the question. Well, let's see here. Um, well, you expressed concern that it would take too long to arrive at solutions uh, that will be uh, amenable to implement uh, to independent divide, divide, um, providers. Excuse me. I was wondering what specific proposals you might have to offer uh, that would benefit customers. Well, um, my view um, is, you know, and I think it's borne out by this panel, is. There's not a broad consensus on the gateway approach, right? right. <clears throat> Mr. Shanks is going to need a lot of convincing. Right. Um, Mr. Young is going to need some convincing. The cable industry is more on board than, than the rest. Sony's on board. <clears throat> but, you know, my experience in this industry over 20 years is that things take a lot longer than we think they're going to take. And the FCC may say 2012, but I don't believe it. And in the interim, cable card is what we rely on. A TiVo box does not work if a cable car does not work. End of story. And we're the only people who depend on it. So we need to make it work today, this year. And we're glad that the FCC is determined to, determined to make that happen. So, you know, we need access to programming. Installation's got to work. And we've got to end this pricing discrimination. That's what we need today. So you're saying the, the, the best thing to do then is to go after cable cards, make them work uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you'll allow me, one more question. One more question, Mr. McCarthy. Okay, McCarty. thank you. Uh, Mr. Shanks, uh, you certainly seem to, to voice concern about the bias in the current program. Uh, do you think a universal gateway device can be developed that would be unbiased, that would allow uh, you to offer services that can be available by the universal gateway device? I do believe that there are probably there are major concerns on our part when it comes down to the economics of a gateway and the advantage that cable would have over satellite and therefore you know what that would do to the marketplace of a gateway and third party devices. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much Mr. McNearney and thanks to all of our witnesses for your outstanding testimony here and uh, what has been a very interesting conversation back and forth with you today. We are going to keep the record of this hearing open for three weeks, and during that period of time, members may well be propounding and writing some additional questions to you. When you receive those, please respond as promptly as you can and help illuminate our uh, record of this hearing with your answers. Uh, our thanks to each of you for taking time with us today, and this hearing stands adjourned.
This morning, a discussion on jobs and the U.S. economy. We'll hear from former Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin and New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg from the Center for American Progress. Live.